Thank you, Miss Hannah, Miss Rachel, our wonderful message and song. Well, at this time, we'll dismiss our children to Children's Church there in the workshop. And uh, as they go on, well, we are looking forward to, I have been looking forward to Brother William, Miss Hannah being with us. Um, they're going to be in the service tonight. I have, uh, I didn't ask if you're singing. I guess I just told you you were singing tonight. <laughs> we just assumed that that was the case. And uh, they've been our missionaries in Bulgaria for many, many years and faithfully serving the Lord there. And uh, you might remember the uh, Christmas time, we take a special offering for the coach for kids and the flour and oil offering. And that was uh, very successful this year. And the Lord uses that in your sacrificial giving uh, to help the, the poor gypsy Turks over there and uh, those who are associated with the church as they uh, give the gospel there in the land of Bulgaria. Well, now, I'm just not sure if we have ever had a preacher with a bow tie but ever before. Um, I guess I guess we're uptown. We're getting a new building now. We're, we're, the standards are being raised, I suppose. I don't know. So uh, we're looking for Brother William, come on if you would and preach for us this morning. Get your Bibles ready, and you'll, you'll enjoy the message. Brother William's a good preacher, and we're glad for him. Amen. God bless you, brother. <laughs> Amen, brother. Joe Gammon said I, I look like an opera singer. <clears throat> and uh, I thought I looked like I should be serving ice cream someplace. <clears throat> but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'll tell you how it came about is, uh, I found these ties and they were just expensive ties, cheap, $5 a piece. Oh and I said, well, I can't pass that up. So I bought a bunch, I bought a bunch of them and then realized I didn't know how to tie them. <laughs> so I had spent the last three days learning how to tie one of these ties and I figured I had to show it off somewhere. <laughs> Just for that experience. If you have your Bible, Genesis chapter 6 this morning. Genesis chapter 6. Very familiar portion of scripture. It's good to be with you. It's good to be in the house of the Lord amongst God's people. Amen. Uh, that's where the Christian feels at home. And that's where he feels at best. Uh, is with God's people in fellowship. And uh, I want to say thank you. Thank you first of all for this opportunity to preach to you. Thank you as well for allowing us to be your missionaries for the last 13 years. Uh, thank you for that. Thank you for your faithful uh, support, for your faithful prayers. And uh, your prayers and your support have seen us through good times and bad times. But they've seen us through. Amen. And we appreciate that. We're thankful for that. You don't always hear, and uh, I don't... Uh, I try never to write the difficulties or the challenges, the trials, the tribulations, just the successes and just the blessings. But it's your prayers and your support that have uh, seen us through all of it. We appreciate it. We're thankful for it. Thank you as well for the uh, love offering for the oil and the flour. For the last 20-some years, we've been trying to help. Uh, Bulgaria is the second poorest country uh, uh, just uh, above Romania in the European Union. It is the first, we have a few distinctions for being such a small country, uh, it is the country with the fastest declining population in Eastern Europe, to the tune of 65,000 people leaving Bulgaria every year. And uh, the, I won't get into the politics of it, it's a big EU thing, they've stifled Bulgaria's industrial growth, so they all have to leave to Germany and Western Europe. Uh, so it also has the distinction of being the smallest country there, uh, one of the smaller countries there. We lead the world in lavender production, oil, rose oil production. If you get lavender here, you get it from Bulgaria. And there's a, a high percentage, a high chance, it's just a little factoid here, we'll get into it. Uh, the, this is in case you make jeopardy and you need to know. Uh, <clears throat> The lavender that you get, if you get it here, you get it, it comes from near where we live and minister over there. Schumann, the, the uh, county, the municipality that we live in, uh, produces more lavender than any place else. Uh, we exceed France and those places. And uh, rose oil, we have an entire valley uh, in the central part of uh, Bulgaria where they exclusively produce rose oil. We lead the world in that. 
And uh, we probably lead the world in a lot of other things like crime and <laughs> other things like that. But I'm not going to mention those right now. But I appreciate the Lord and thank you for your support. Uh, I mentioned the flour and the oil in the month of February, the first three weeks of February. Uh, we distributed over, they distributed, excuse me, uh, 76 tons of uh, flour and uh, 7,500 liters of oil to about 2,000 families uh, in the, uh, of our believers over there. And so they expressed their thanks to you. And uh, the missionary said it went great. Uh, it's one of our favorite times of the year. My boys, who are now bigger now, Carrick just turned 15 the other day, Christian's 13, they grew up carrying bags of flour every year, 50-pound bags of flour into those village churches, uh, into those little places there. That's one of our favorite times because we get to see the entire scope of the work. For the last three years, I go to seven churches weekly with a national pastor by the name of Ahmed. Since COVID, we've been trying to build his churches back up. Uh, the pandemic was worldwide. It affected us even in the tiny country of Bulgaria. Uh, we saw a lot of deaths, a lot of things like that. And we've been over the last three years trying to build it up. We've seen people saved. Uh, when uh, the restrictions were finally lifted and we were able to meet together corporately again, we saw 31 people baptized that have been saved during that period. And it's always good to know that no matter what the world does, they can't stop the Lord. Amen. And no matter what restrictions they put on, they can't restrict Him. He Amen. is unlimited, unbound. And so we appreciate that. Uh, Brother Larry Leach, who does the coach for kids, he is just in on a furlough. And we heard last night that he had emergency gallbladder surgery. So if you'd keep him in your prayers, that went well. They're trying to expand the Coach for Kids ministry into, a, uh, uh, into everything. If you have a need, if you have a need for clothing, we've got a central location now to where the national pastors can come and uh, pick up uh, any art article of clothing, anything they can get a hold of and distribute it to their families, to those in need. So that's been going on. The Lord's been blessing there. And uh, we appreciate all that you do and all that you uh, send uh, for us. I want to mention two other things quickly. Uh, we have a building that we've been working on in Avran, and that's finally, uh, my father-in-law said the other day, $5,000 more would finish it off. The next day, $10,000 came in. So that entire building and complex will be done. And we appreciate that. That's where we meet together to manufacture our Bibles that we distribute, to manufacture our hymnals that we distribute. We distribute in two different languages but uh, and uh, two different alphabets. And it's kind of confusing there. We have the Cyrillic alphabet, which is Russian. And then we have the Latin, which is the one we use, English, uh, same characters. Uh, the Turkish language is both in Cyrillic and in Latin, the people that we deal with. So it's kind of a headache, but that's where we meet together to print those, to manufacture those. And uh, where we also meet together, we have uh, enough missionary families over there that we meet together on a weekly basis or try to, to have church among the English missionaries. That's where we meet to do that. That's where the Coats, of kid, uh, Coats for Kids building is. So the Lord has blessed us. He's provided that. And then uh, most importantly, uh, the, the Bible, uh, Brother Ralph Cheatwood started translating the Bible into the Turkish language. They had uh, the history of the Turkish language. In 1925, Turkey became a modern republic. And prior to that, they used Arabic script. And when Ataturk founded the country, he decided we will uh, purge, uh, we will, we, we'll have a Turkey for Turks. And uh, we'll purge all the Arabic influences. We'll purge all the Islamic influences from our language. And we'll have a language and a culture strictly for Turks. And uh, in 1925, he did that. But they never had, from that point, a, 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 a translation in that modern Turkish language. So in 1980, Brother Ralph began to translate. Uh, there were other translations, but they were from the RV. They were from corrupt texts, and they were from... Uh, they were just modern Bibles. And uh, Brother Ralph tra began translating from the Textus Receptus and from the he Greek and the Hebrew. And uh, he, he used the King James Bible as his guide. 
And uh, now that, that Bible that he translated uh, is now being played on the radio stations, the Christian radio station in the country of Turkey. Amen. And uh, he, he asked the question of the Lord when he began. He said, who am I translating this for? He said, I've been here. He was there from the mid-70s all the way to the early 90s. Never had a single Turkish convert. He had one convert that was uh, a Kurd, and he was uh, saved in Germany. But he said, who am I translating this Bible for? And he said, nobody, the Turks don't want it. They're Muslims or they're secularists. They don't want it. The Turks in Germany don't want it. They've gone after Western money. Who, do I, who am I translating this for? Then in 1991, the Lord sent him up to Bulgaria and then on to Romania where there were Turkish speaking people who didn't have the word of God. And uh, they received the word of God and were saved by the thousands. And he learned, that's who I'm translating this Bible for. God had a people ready for it. And then his desire was always to get the word of God back into Turkey. That was where his heart was at. That's where he started at. But he passed away and never saw that fulfilled. But now that Bible is, uh, is in the country of Turkey and it's being played on the uh, radio station there, the Christian radio station. So I appreciate the Lord. He does great things. Amen. Uh, Genesis chapter six, Genesis chapter number six, and I appreciate your patience with the bow tied preacher. <clears throat> I have one concern about this bow tie. Uh, for years, uh, regular neckties are Baptist bibs, you know. They, that's the only thing that's kept preachers' shirts from being grease stained. And <laughs> you got to be real careful. I might have to find another source to protect my shirt. Amen. <laughs> Some of you got Baptist bibs on. It's the only thing that's kept your shirts. You can't move on to the bow ties yet. <laughs> next week. Next, next week, we'll all go to smoothies and salads and won't worry about fried chicken. <laughs> Amen. Genesis chapter 6. Let's read in verse number 1. The Bible says, And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair. And they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that. When the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. And God saw the wickedness of man was uh, that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and every and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that He had made man on the earth, and it grieved Him. At his heart. And the Lord said. I will destroy man. Whom I have created from the face of the earth. Both man and beast. And the creeping thing. And the fowls of the air. For it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah. Found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father we come before you. Lord you know every heart. You know every soul in this building this morning. God, you know our needs, you know who we are, there's no pretense, Lord, we'd ask for your help. Lord, you said we could come and obtain mercy. You said we could find grace to help in the time of need. And Lord, we ask for your grace and we ask for your mercy. And Lord, I ask for your attendance and your special help. I ask, Lord, for the unction, Lord, for the anointing, God, to declare your word. God, give us hearing ears and obedient hearts and help us this morning. Lord, except you help us, God, it's in vain. Except you work among us and except you uh, touch us and help us and quicken us and enable us. Lord, God, we can't do anything. We're but flesh. But Lord, we look to you. Our eyes are upon you. We would ask this morning for your blessings upon the word of God. 
Lord, for your blessings upon your people and for the moving of the Holy Ghost on our hearts. And Lord, we would ask especially if there is one here, God, that doesn't know you, that doesn't know what it is to be a child of God, that doesn't know the new birth. Lord God, that you would touch that heart especially. God, that you would give hearing ears. May they hear today the word of God. And Lord, may they feel in their hearts that invitation, Lord, to come and give them courage in that hour to respond. Oh God, to accept what you have, to accept your son. We'd ask this, Lord, in Jesus' good name and for his sake. Amen. 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 This is uh, not a new uh, thought from this passage of scripture. This is a passage of scripture that I suppose uh, even the children grow up learning, maybe uh, the ark itself and the story of the ark. Maybe children don't understand the necessity or the background behind it, but everybody for, uh, by and large is familiar with Noah and his ark. And so this is not a new thing. Uh, this is not a new thought, but I want to bring maybe some uh, some uh, to remind us again of some things from this passage in the scripture. I've got five points this morning and I, I've got uh, 20 minutes, so we'll, we'll uh, do our best. I want you to notice first of all in this passage, and I don't use this word lightly or frivolously, uh, but I want you to notice a hellish existence. I use that adjective specifically because that's what it was. In Noah's day, the powers of hell had been exalted and uh, humanity had been uh, swept up in, uh, and, and seemingly the devil had free reign, the prince and the power of the air. All flesh had corrupted its way. The imagination of the hearts were only evil continually. I can't imagine a more hellish existence than that. When man uh, had no regard for their fellow men, when men had no regard for right or wrong or good or, or kindness, when virtue was absent, when uh, uh, humanity itself was corrupt and there was no feeling of compassion or neighborliness that was all gone from the earth and every man as uh, has been quoted uh, in the book of Judges every man did that which was right in his own eyes served himself I read the other day in the book of Thessalonians uh, when Paul talked about perilous times and of all the sins that he lists there, he starts with men shall be lovers of their own selves. And he concludes with men shall be lovers uh, of pleasure more than lovers of God. And those two things together, that selfishness, a selfish uh, a, a, a concern only for self and uh, uh, the, the, the pleasure that you can derive only for yourself. Uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, how do I want to say it? That... Uh, no regard for anybody else and, and no regard for human life and no regard for your neighbor. If it pleases you, do it. If it satisfies you, do it. And that's the environment that was in this day. And uh, that's not uh, 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 unusual to us. This is not foreign to us. We are seeing the exact same things in our day. This is not historical. This is history repeating itself. Jesus said in the book of Matthew and in the New Testament, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. And that same attitude, that uh, same hellishness is in our day and is uh, prevailing in our day. I wish it, we could say it wasn't, but it is growing. We wish we could say it was diminishing and that uh, things were getting better. But but the scripture tells us evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. And it's not going to get any better. As a matter of fact, uh, into, the, into this hellish existence, uh, God uh, uh, interjects to Noah and prophesies, Noah, uh, uh, judgment is coming on this world. And can I say that to you this morning? In, I, in those same circumstances that judgment is coming on this world, coming again to this world. 
I see a hellish existence here. Look at this. I see a mingling of the holy and the unholy. And if we don't see that in our days, I don't know if you are blind to that in our days, then you are absolutely blind. But there was a mingling of the holy and the unholy. Nothing was sacred. Nothing was set apart or sanctified. Everything was a, 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 a muddled mess. And there was nothing they called nothing holy. And they called nothing profane. Everything was acceptable. Not only was there a mingling of the holy and the unholy, uh, but there was a, a, the imagination of their hearts was, was only evil continually. So far have they banished light. So far have they banished uh, truth. So far have they banished the, anything contrary to their wills that they were only in darkness and the imagination of their heart was only evil continually. Those are the days that you're entering into. And those are the days that you're finding yourself in. I see their a hellish existence. So great uh, was their uh, wickedness. The Bible said in verse number five, and God. Uh, God, it's important to note there, who is this God? This is God who is rich in mercy. This is uh, God who uh, so loved the world. This is love personified. God is love. But so great was the wickedness that they had exhausted his mercy to the point that he had said, I'll judge the world. God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And that the imagina every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Verse 6, and it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. Uh, I, I don't think there's any greater indication of how far things had gone than that sentence that it grieved the Lord at his heart. We could talk about the sins that they had committed. We could talk about their <clears throat> ungodly lifestyles, their ungodly choices, the corruption that they uh, reveled in. But there's no greater indication of how wicked things had gotten that it grieved the Lord at his heart that he had even made man. That he had even made man. I say there's a hellish existence, but I notice in the middle of all this, a heroic example. And thank God for that. That in the middle of all of this corruption, that in the middle of all of this barbarity and sin and wickedness, God had a man. God had his people there. Thank God running parallel with this, men were calling upon the name of the Lord. Well, all of the world was running after pleasure and seeking only their own and had no regard for anybody else or sanctity of life. There were people who were calling on the name of the Lord. Do you remember after a Cain had, uh, had killed his brother Abel and murder was introduced into this world that God gave another son and after Seth was born then began Again, men to call upon the name of the Lord. And while all of this was going on, there were still souls who were walking with God. There were still souls who were seeking the Lord. You look back in verse uh, chapter number 5 and we see in uh, verse 22, and Enoch walked with God. In the middle of all this, there were still people who knew. There were still people who knew there is something better. Uh, there is something better than serving yourselves and pleasing only yourselves. There is a God in heaven that will require this at our hands. And Enoch set himself to walk with God and to seek God. And I want to say this, uh, this heroic example here of Noah. Uh, he had an example. Do you understand that Noah didn't come up with this on his own? Uh, uh, he had a, a, a relation that walked with God. Uh, Peter says that uh, Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Well, where did he ever hear preaching from? Well, Enoch prophesied. We learn from the book of Jude. In other words, Noah had a godly example. The Bible here talks about Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. I thought coming down the road this morning that uh, you might not be perfect in your generations. You might be the first Christian. Uh, your people might not have uh, uh, grown up in church or attended church. But what you can do and what you will do affects those that come be uh, behind you. 
And uh, you can lead an example for somebody else. Though you had no example uh, predecessor, you can be the example for a generation coming on. And Enoch walked with God because there were children. As a matter of fact, the Bible says in that same verse, and Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah. Uh, Enoch walked with God because he realized I've got a boy now I've got a son and uh, he sees all of this out here and he's going to need to see an, a godly example he sees the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes and the pride of life he's going to need to see a godly example and if I'm not that godly example he won't find it in anybody else and Enoch purposed in his heart to walk with God so that Methuselah might have an example we don't know how Methuselah walked. We don't know uh, how uh, Methuselah behaved himself. But we do know that there was somebody else. We do know that there was a grandchild and a great grandchild. And somebody took that example and said, I want to be like him. He is different. He's my hero in this wicked generation. Everybody, it's easy to go with the crowd. But that man stands alone. I want to be like him. A heroic example. Amen. Noah was one. Uh, the Bible said in the New Testament, wherein eight souls, wherein uh, that it eight souls, only eight, only eight were saved. You talk about standing up in the in, in the face of everything, in the face of all and eight souls. Noah stood alone preaching. Noah stood alone preaching. I want to be that in the face of all of it. God give us all of that to where we can stand up though we're alone and say, no, I'm going to follow the Lord. Yeah. You remember, uh, you remember uh, Joshua when he stood before those people there? He said, I don't know what path you made, but as for me, I don't know what you're going to do. I don't know the choices you will make, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I imagine Noah made that same resolution. Everybody's going one way, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. A heroic example. There's a lot of things about Noah. The Bible said uh, the verse that we read, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I like what one preacher said. Why did Noah find grace? Because he was looking for grace. Seek and ye shall find. And Noah found grace because he knew this is an endeavor. I can't make it without the grace of God. I haven't the strength. I haven't the wit. I haven't the wisdom, the ability, the power. Not to conform to this generation. Not to go with my peers headlong into destruction. I needed a, an opposing force. And that force is the grace of God. He said, I need the grace of the Lord. And he sought the grace of God. Amen. You know what we should be doing and what we are doing here this morning. We know, hey, listen, too long outside these four walls and not just these walls, but too long outside the fellowship of believers, we begin to conform to this world. We haven't the power to, uh, to stand on our own by ourselves. Now, what a devastating thing the, uh, the pandemic was and what a devilish thing that got people out of the fellowship. That got people out of the assembly and thought why uh, the virtual church is just as good or is just as, and the Lord used it in its time. It was a necessary thing, but it was necessary until we could come back together. You can't replace this. There is no substitute for the fellowship of the saints. This is where you draw strength. This is where you garner hope. This is where you find the grace of the Lord Jesus. Do you remember when John, uh, in in the book of Revelation chapter number one, his clearest picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Where was it? In the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. In other words, he saw clearest the Lord Jesus in the church. In the church. Noah here sought for grace and he found grace. That's the good thing about everybody that seeks from the Lord. They find. And if you seek the grace of God, you'll find it. And if you seek mercy, he's rich in mercy. And if you seek faith, he gives faith. And if you seek help, he disposes help. God is disposed to be gracious to all that come and ask from him. Amen. I see a heroic example. He was a preacher of righteousness in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 7. I like Noah's little biographical sketch there because it begins with by faith and ends with by faith. By faith, Noah. 
<laughs> when he was warned of God, of things not seen as yet prepared, uh, uh, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his household. I like that begins with faith and ends with faith. He's an example, a, a, a heroic example that we too should live our lives by faith. This is all by faith. Yeah. Amen. We trust the Lord. Uh, every time I'm over in this uh, section of the country, I, I stop by uh, the graveyard over there and uh, look at my dad's tombstone. And uh, there's, uh, there's a verse on there. And Brother Fittis preached it at his funeral in Acts chapter 27. And uh, in spite of what I might feel, in spite of my emotions... Uh, at that visit and looking at that tombstone and the remembrances, that verse always cheers me. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer. Amen. For I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. Amen. And I might come there with a broken heart. And I might come there with misgivings. And I might come there wanting to talk. But I'm reminded that I can be of good cheer because it will be even as it was told me. And Noah believed God. The message came to Noah. And he believed God. And he lived his life by. He hadn't seen it as yet. There's a lot of things that we preach that we haven't seen. But we believe God. We believe that judgment is coming on this world and it's not a universal flood. It's fire from heaven. We believe that. We haven't seen it. I mean, you can uh, get the Hubble or get the, the new telescope and you won't see it out there. But brother, it's coming. It's coming. We believe it. We live by faith. We seek the grace of God. But I noticed something else about this heroic example here is he took the word of God seriously. He took the word of God seriously. When God said there was a flood coming, when God said, uh, here's a blueprint, here's a pattern, he yeah. did not deviate at all. Amen. He took God's word seriously. There was no if, ands, or buts. There was no room for variance. There was no question mark over what God said. There's a whole lot of people that seek the grace of the Lord. There's a whole lot of people that try to live by faith. But in this area of taking the word of God exclusively, of uh, believing that there's a whole lot of that people hang a whole lot of question marks over God's word. Do you remember that's what the Pharisees did? They had hung so many question marks over the Old Testament law and they had brought in so many other rabbis and so many other teachers that the word meant nothing. And so when Jesus stood up and declared it, they said, this man uh, speaks as one having authority and not as, why? Because he didn't say, he didn't consult the rabbis. He didn't say, well, rabbi so-and-so believes it this way or this school of thought is this. No, he said, God said this and that's the way it'll be. And Noah believed that when God said judgment was coming, Noah said, let's get ready. When God said, Noah, here's a blueprint. Noah, they might have come up and said, well, what if we do it this way? Or maybe his son said, dad, I don't think that'll go. Hey, listen, this is the way God said it. And this is the way we're doing it. This is the way it is. This is God's blueprint. We are damned. And I don't use that word. But if we deviate, we are damned. This is God's blueprint here. There's a whole lot of people who come to it and don't like what it has to say. And so they begin to mess with it or turn it or change it. And if you deviate, if you don't take it seriously, you are condemned as well. Yeah. A heroic example. He took God's word seriously. Yeah. I wonder if we took God seri God's word seriously, how things would be different. Mm -hmm. yeah. Come on. We take it in theory, yeah. but in practice. If we believed there was a literal fiery burning hell. You remember the old, and it was sung here the other night. See our fathers and our mothers and our children sinking down. If we took the word of God seriously, how would our mission efforts, how would they dip, how would our lives differ? Yeah. If we believe seriously that we should all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, how would our lives differ? See, right now we sort of put those thoughts back or right now we don't like to confront them. But Noah said, I've got no other choice. It's either death or take God's word at its face value. And I'm going to believe God. Yeah. 
He took God's word seriously. Then I noticed this, a horrendous eradication. God's word's true whether Noah believed it or not. If Noah had never done anything in preparation, God's word was un unalterable. There was judgment coming. And whether you make any preparations for that or not, it's on its way. Whether you uh, take it seriously, whether you uh, procrastinate, that doesn't change the fact at all. I preached the other day about where Peter said, or where Paul said, the time of my departure is at hand. And every last one of us have a departure date. I've got six tickets for, this, uh, for Jan, uh, July 23rd. They're set in stone, so to speak, as, as in stone as the airlines can make them. But whether my bags are packed, that plane is leaving. Whether my documents are in order, that plane is fueled and taken off. Whether I have everything that I wanted to take, whether I've said all the goodbyes I want to say, whether I've conveyed every emotion I want, the plane is leaving, the departure is there. There's no altering that. And friend, you have a departure date. You have a date where you'll leave this world, ready or not. It's, it doesn't matter your health. You can be in the prime of health. You can be in the prime of life. It doesn't consider your age. It doesn't consider the state of your body. The Lord Jesus has the keys of death and hell. And you come when he calls. Right. You'll have a departure day. You have a leaving day. And you'd better make preparation for it. There is a judgment coming. There is an afterlife. And if you've only lived for this and made no preparations for the other, then in hell you will lift up your eyes. Luke chapter 16, that man lived, I mean, he lived every day for the day. But there came a day when he lived no more. And he opened his eyes in hell. And in hell, the scripture says, three times in that passage, being in torments reiterates it over and over and over again. This place of torment. He could have been spared that. Matter of fact, that's what he said. I've got five brothers. I, uh, isn't it strange that he began his mission efforts after? And what was every answer, every single answer to his prayer? No. No. Your praying days are over. The opportunity for you, for you to secure an answer is gone. But he asked that question. He, he said, I've got five brothers. Uh, the answer came back from Abraham. They have Moses and the prophets. They have the word of God. Let them hear them. They have the scriptures. Let them hear. No, nay, Father Abraham. But if one rose from the dead. He said, if one rose from the dead. If they believe not uh, Moses and the prophets. They won't believe though one rose from the dead. You know what you have here this morning? You have Moses and the prophets. You have the scriptures. And if you don't believe God's word. That your death is imminent. That there is a judgment. Then there is no hope for you. If you don't take God's word seriously. There is a horrendous eradication. There was nobody saved. If you weren't inside the ark. All life was lost. It didn't matter how high you scaled. It doesn't matter if, uh, if you uh, concocted some a flotation device. If all life was extinguished. All of the best efforts of man failed at the judgment. Right. Eight souls, eight souls, eight souls only. And where were they at? They were in the ark. Amen. How did they get in the ark? By faith. Yes. Amen. There's a horrendous eradication. I want to say, uh, fourthly, there's a uh, heavenly escape. Hey, judgment's coming. Departure's coming, but there is a way of escape. He made a way of escape. God in his love for you, God in his love for me, oh, he made a way of escape. He looked down there at Noah and he said, judgment will come. But he said, I have a means to escape the judgment. Noah, here it is. And you know, every single facet of that ark that he laid out, there was a type of the Lord Jesus. 
Every single facet, every in that blueprint, every note, every jot, every tittle pointed back to the Lord Jesus. He is our ark of safety. He alone is your way to escape judgment. He alone will secure you. If you're not in him, when departure comes, you're headed the wrong place. Oh, listen, every soul that's in him winds up where he's going. And every soul not in him, hey, you're going to the devil's hell. I like to, not long after I met Brother Fittis, I heard uh, Brother Moore preach, and I went and found sermon audio, went and found Brother Moore's, some of his old sermons, and I listened to his testimony there. And that's, that, uh, to this day, it's a, I, I love to listen to it once a year, twice a year, Brother Moore's testimony. About him being in a punk band and uh, dressing all kind of ways. And he said that he went to this, <laughs> the only place they could find to practice uh, their punk rock music was in the house of uh, one of the members' grandmothers who was a Christian woman. He said she looked like uh, Tweety Bird's grandmother, said they looked exactly like that. And she would suffer him to go out in the garage and bang and hoot and scream around. And then uh, she'd come in there and she'd say, I've made tea and I've made sandwiches. And she'd bring these punk rockers into this little dining room, immaculate, and all these fellas and their grips and their piercings and their whatever. And uh, Brother David said she'd begin to preach to them. This little old woman, she'd point her finger at them and said, sure, you're playing the devil's music and you're going to a devil's hell if you don't trust Jesus. And uh, in his testimony, Brother David said, I thought she was radical. <laughs> he said, my, I've never heard anything like this. Oh, my soul, this woman's way out there. <laughs> he said, I'm in purple and <laughs> whatever else. But he looked at this woman, this old little old woman telling us we're going to a devil's hell. And he said, man, she's, she's too far. She's out there. But, you know, she warned them and faithfully preached to them. And it wasn't long before Brother David got saved. Amen. And another person got saved. And they all came to the... Why? Because somebody stood up and said, You're going to a devil's hell. Except you get in the Lord Jesus. Well, how do I get in the Lord Jesus? Uh, you remember on the cross of Calvary. Do you remember uh, just like this ark here? This is a strange thing about this ark. If you were to build a boat... Would you put a door in the side of the boat? That doesn't make sense, does it? Especially a boat that's going to have to endure cataclysmic forces, rain falling from heaven, floods coming up. You wouldn't put a door in the side of it. Oh, that doesn't make any sense in the world. But nevertheless, that's where the door was. You read over there at the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus. He bows his head and says, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And shortly thereafter, a Roman soldier, what's he do? He pierces his side. Pierces his side. And the Bible says, forthwith came blood and water. They thought it only as a means of verifying his death. But they didn't realize it was a means of opening, creating an entrance into the ark of safety for whosoever will. Thank God the door was opened at Calvary. A door opened in the side of the ark. That water came out to give life. Living water, thank God. Blood came out to cleanse us from all of our sins. To wash away, to cleanse the vilest sinner. And the door remained open for whosoever will, thank God. There's a heavenly escape ordained by God, given by God. And it pictured the Lord Jesus Christ. I want, you, I want to say something else about this. Do you realize that in the ark was everything they needed to survive? Everything they needed to endure was in the ark. All the food, not only for them, for all, everything that they needed for life after. Everything they needed was in the Everything they needed to survive their days were in the ark. And everything that you need is in the Lord Jesus. Amen. You need not look any place else. Everything that you need. What did, the, what did Peter say? He has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. 
all things, everything that you need to live in this world, you can find in the Lord Jesus. Somebody said, well, pleasure. Hey, listen, I've got more pleasure in the house of God than you've ever had outside of the house of God. This is pleasure. This is godly pleasure. This is holy pleasure. This is lasting pleasure. This is pleasure that you don't have to regret or apologize for. This is pleasure that you can seek again and it'll be there again. It will not diminish in the using. Pleasure, life, grace, everything in the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything that they needed to live and survive was in him. And besides that, when the ark reached its destination, everything there provided for everything to come. When it reached Ararat, Uh, The waters had abated, but they still had animals there for sacrifice. They still had wood. Everything was in the ark for their life afterwards. Thank God. Everything you need is in the ark for here and for here to come for eternity. I like this bow tie. It's working pretty good. (laughs) Heavenly escape. Finally, I see a holy invitation. A holy invitation. <clears throat> the Bible says. In verse chapter 7. In verse number 1. And the Lord said unto Noah. Come thou. And all thy house into the ark. Come thou. Come thou into the ark. I like that he didn't say go into the ark. He said come where I am. Amen. Jesus said come unto me. All you that labor and are heavy laden, come to the Lord Jesus. There's life in him. There's forgiveness with him. There's love with him. There's acceptance with him. We have a world that preaches acceptance and inclusivity, but they lie. Yeah, they, they, don't, they won't accept you. They won't accept that. They, they only accept those of their stripe and hue. They're not inclusive. Don't be deceived. They preach it every single day on your television, on social media, acceptance and inclusivity and God. Le- and they don't mean a single thing. If you came just like you were uh, a, a southerner from middle Tennessee with a Bible, they wouldn't accept you. Hey, if you, you, they preach inclusivity, go wave an Israeli flag or even an American flag up on Columbia campus. See if they include you in their powwows. They don't mean it. But when Jesus says, come unto me, he means it. Hey, come to me. You are sinful and vile. I'll wash you. Hey, I'll forgive you. Doesn't matter how you come. I will change you. I will take you as you are. I will wash away your sins in my blood. And I will make of you a new creature. Thank God. All things will pass away. Behold, all things will become new. He's the only one that when he says come, he means it. Come as you are and I'll do the changing. Well, I've got to get better. I've got to change. I've got to, you said my my grandfather before, uh, he was uh, my my mother's dad, which uh, if you ever knew him would explain a lot about my mother. Hopefully she's tuned off by now. (laughs) 12 o'clock, she's probably looking for something to eat. (laughs) But uh, he was an obstinate man, never talked to us growing up. That never said a word except it was a bad word. Didn't, we didn't converse. We didn't know anything about him. Lived in the same. We, we visited him twice, three times a week. Ate over there all the time. Uh, but when he began to get under conviction. Up in his 80s. And he knew death is coming. He had had one heart attack. And he didn't know uh, what was around the bend. One day he called my mother over in urgency. And he had his checkbook out there. And he said, I want to write a check to the church. And my mother said, that's not how you get it. You don't buy this. This was bought and paid for. This was bought for you. You don't buy this. Somebody bought it for you. She said, you get this by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, I've been meaning to do that. And there in the front room of his house, he knelt down and he got saved. My mother had called me before that. She said, your grandfather's under conviction. Come over here and witness to him. In the five minute drive, I prayed and I was so scared and nervous that I wouldn't say the right thing or I wouldn't. But when I pulled up in that driveway, he was already standing on his front porch and he had his arms out wide like that. And he grabbed me up and he said, I'm saved. 
He said, I love you. Do you know what God did when he saved him? He loosed his tongue. He said, I hadn't told your mother I've loved her in 40 years. He said, I, I can't stop saying it. I love you. I love you. I love. What happened? He heard a holy invitation. He thought, well, I'll do it my way. I'll do it this. No, you don't. Come as you are. Come to Jesus. Thank God. Come thou into the ark. Everything that you have, everything that you need is in him. He'll take care of the rest. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for the invitation that went out. Thank you, Lord, for that day I heard. Thank you, Lord, for that day by the Holy Ghost, my ears were open. And I heard and came to Jesus. Lord, thank you for that. Lord, we pray this morning that that invitation would go out. Lord God, that every heart here, Lord, if there's a soul that's lost, God, they'd respond to the invitation before it's too late. They'd come to Jesus. They'd come to the ark. Lord God, they'd come to you. Lord, for the children of God, would you help us to be like Noah? Would you help us to seek you, to walk with you, to stand for you, to believe you, to take your word seriously, to do what you command? Said Noah did everything that God commanded him. Lord, help us to do the same. I pray that you'd bless now. We commit this time, this people to your hands in Jesus' name. Amen.